Welcome. My name is Patty Sopis. I'm a librarian at Santa Monica College, and I will be presenting this workshop, News Literacy Strategies for Evaluating News. This workshop is being recorded, so you might prefer to mute yourself or turn off your camera. You can still ask questions on chat. I will be answering questions at the end of the workshop. In this workshop, we're going to look at definitions, meaning what are we talking about? We'll look at some players and mechanics of the news ecosystem and where news readers are in this news ecosystem. And we'll look at some ways to detect and decipher misinformation and disinformation. What is news? Here is a list of general criteria for news worthiness, but these criteria do not talk about the processes that lead to credible news reporting. This definition starts out with a similar description of news. I want you to notice that this definition is very explicit about the process that is used to create news reports. Credible news reporting is gathered, verified, and structured in accordance with journalistic norms before being published in media, ranging from newspapers to live blogs. The word verified is very important here. It indicates that the journalist has firsthand knowledge or multiple sources. How do journalists find news? We're going to take a look at a short video from the BBC um, talking about just that. Hello, I'm Radzi, and today we're looking at the different ways that journalists find and gather news. Now, news stories don't always happen quickly. A story can take months or even years to form. So journalists have to work extremely hard when researching a story. They need to consider where to find their sources and to figure out what questions to ask in order to tell their story. The internet has changed this process over the years by providing access to vast amounts of information. But ultimately, the thing that fuels many journalists is a sense of curiosity. That's what drives them to dig deeper and uncover critical details for meaningful news. Let's take a look. The media landscape is changing and journalists are finding new ways of covering the news. But now it's 7.30. Time for Newsroom. In the past, reporters found the news by talking to sources. He doesn't say anything apart from the fact that he won't say anything. And he's Updates from correspondents and news agencies on the ground and newspapers. Nowadays, they still use their traditional and trusted sources. But there are new tools to find out what people are talking about online. When something big happens in the world, people post on social media. New systems flash. Correspondents around the world send alerts. Journalists put in calls to find out what's going on and send teams to the scene. Reporters talk to eyewitnesses and emergency services, gather interviews and statements. Here come the riot police, here come the water cannon. We're about to start report live or send in material for other parts of the newsroom to use. So the point of journalism hasn't changed, but there's so much more information out there now that journalists use different tools to tell people what's happening. Thank you very much for watching. So why is news important in a democracy? Shared knowledge is required for public discourse about politics and society. And accurate news helps people make informed decisions in a democracy. What is news literacy? News literacy is the ability to use critical thinking skills to judge the reliability and credibility of news reports, whether they come via print, television, or the internet. You should keep in mind the line between skepticism and cynicism. Skepticism or, you know, healthy uh, doubt, um, not easily convinced thinking is often prudent. However, people who are cynical will refuse to believe things, 
even that are true. So keep that in mind. Think about where you go to get news. People can get news from many sources. Whatever your news habits are, you should know the hallmarks of quality journalism. Here are some essential features of quality journalism. I want to point out that when professional journalists make an error, they are expected to retract, correct, and or apologize. And professional journalists should correct errors quickly. The Society of Professional Journalists has a code of ethics, and I'm going to take us to that society's website so we can look at their code of ethics. So these, this code of ethics includes seeking truth and reporting it, minimizing harm, acting independently, and being accountable and transparent. Journalism is a profession and uh, professional journalists uh, use these um, techniques and these principles as guidelines. Uh, and there are lots of uh, specifics about how to go about um, carrying out these um, ethical uh, actions. So if we look under seek truth and report it, uh, we see diligently seek subjects of news coverage to allow them to respond to criticism or allegations of wrongdoing. Um, also, avoid undercover or other surreptitious methods of gathering information to the public, uh, excuse me, gathering information unless traditional open methods will not yield information vital to the public and being vigilant and courageous about holding those with power accountable. Give voice to the voiceless. Hi, I'm Radsey, and today we're looking at who decides what you see, read, and hear in the news. Behind the scenes, there are journalists whose job it is to make decisions about the final report that's published, and increasingly, computer algorithms are being used to make decisions. So while you're watching, think about the choices that are made and how they affect the stories that appear in your timeline. Everything you see and hear on the news is filtered. Because the number of things happening every day in the world is immeasurable. But journalists have limited space to report the news. When you get your news from the TV, radio or news websites, senior journalists called editors are responsible for deciding which stories to tell, based on what they think you want to know and need to know. But when you get your news from apps, social media and websites that aren't run by journalists, often computer programs decide what you see. These programs are operated by the companies that own the app or website. They might want you to see as many ads as possible, which makes them money, or try to influence your views. So they use algorithms to show you the content they think you want to see. Things that make you angry or happy, so you share them and attract more people to the site. One way to see the bigger picture is to get your news from lots of sources. See how different apps and websites prioritize different stories and how the same story can be told in lots of different ways. Now you can think about well, actually, who I'll... makes the decisions when you watch the news or read finish. a story online and why those decisions have been made. Is the story informative or entertaining? Does it hold power to account or has it been published just to make money from advertising? Now you can apply this to your learning. Ultimate, ultimately, most news is distributed by organizations, and those organizations can be compared to each other on uh, what news they select and how they present that news. All Sides is a media literacy company with a methodology for rating bias of media outlets, 
on a political spectrum from left to right. Uh, if we define bias as a point of view or perspective, then all news outlets have bias, but this does not mean that the content is false. The human tendency is to dismiss sources that have a bias different from our own bias, also known as confirmation bias. All Sides uses multiple methods to rate media bias, including editorial reviews, blind bias surveys, independent reviews, and third-party research. Notice the statement at the top of this chart. Ratings based on online U.S. political content only, not TV, print, or radio. Radi ratings do not reflect accuracy or credibility. They reflect perspective only. Just because you agree or dis disagree with something uh, does not mean it is right or wrong or credible news or fake news. This Pew Research Center survey of 5,035 U.S. adults examines whether members of the public can recognize news as factual, something that's capable of being proved or disproved by objective, objective evidence or as an opinion that reflects the belief and values of whomever expressed it. The main portion of the study measured the public's ability to distinguish between five factual statements and five opinion statements. The findings reveal that even this basic task presents a challenge. The study found that a majority of Americans correctly identified at least three of the five factual statements in each set. But this result is only a little better than random guesses. Far fewer Americans got all five correct and roughly a quarter got most or all wrong. Even more revealing is that certain Americans do far better at parsing through this content than others. In addition to political awareness, party identification plays a role in how Americans differentiate between factual and opinion news statements. Both Republicans and Democrats show a propensity to be influenced by which side of the aisle a statement appeals to most. For example, members of each political party were more likely to label both factual and opinion statements as factual when they appealed more to their political side. So understanding bias. Bias can be examined from dimensions other than partisan bias. Um, for example, there are perspectives such as urban versus rural, nationalist versus globalist, and secular versus religious. This slide also lists corporate bias, demographic bias, big story bias, and neutrality bias. Also, we have forms of bias. So that that um, bias can take absence of fairness and balance, framing a story in a certain way, uh, tone in the words and presentation, story selection, and flawed sourcing. Um, I'm going to jump now to um, a different uh, uh, table and, um, excuse me, chart. And what this is, uh, is that we can evaluate the reliability of each publication separately from its bias or perspective. Um, so this media bias chart is uh, produced by Ad Fontes Media, a public benefit company. It also shows bias from left to right, most extreme to most extreme and hyperpartisan left to hyperpartisan right with varying degrees in between. And uh, it, but what it does is it adds a framework for evaluating reliability independently from bias. It gives um, a, shows bias from left to right, but it also adds the vertical dimension here. Um, and that, um, excuse me, vertical dimension to, to show reliable re reliability ranking. And so the y-axis ranges from fact reporting at the top down to contains inaccurate fabricated information at the bottom. And um, as you move down the y-axis, uh, there is more opinion that may not be uh, substantiated. Um, and uh, there are, um, you're gonna find less reliable 
as you go down. So some are select, some of these um, resources have selective, incomplete, unfair persuasion, propaganda, or other issues. Uh, further down in reliability is containing misleading information and the very bottom is contains inaccurate fabricated information. Um, we can see that AP, which stands for Associated Press, which is a press service that many newspapers um, and other news sources draw on for um, uh, different news stories, breaking news stories. Um, and that so a, a Associated Press, AP, and Reuters are in the middle of the um, left to right uh, political um, scale, but they're right in the middle, but then, and they're also up towards the top, the mix of fact reporting and analysis or simple fact reporting. The Pew Research Center, which we just saw a slide from, does surveys and they're actually um, reporting straight from their surveys. Um, so they're doing thorough fact reporting or fact dense analysis according to this media bias chart. So um, at the bottom, we see something called Tony Michaels Report, which is a podcast and it has problems such as being selective, incomplete, using unfair persuasion, propaganda or other issues. Um, and then near the bottom, and that's in the bottom left, that's the bottom left um, politically. And then the bottom right politically um, is uh, natural news, which contains misleading information. So this online version, there's an online version of this chart, and it allows you to search through thousands of websites, podcasts, and TV broadcasters to see where they are on the chart. And so um, that there is a link to this on the library's uh, research guide on um, news literacy, fake news and news literacy. So you can get to that. If you just go to Ad Fontes Media, you would find the online version where you can actually search for a particular um, media outlet or publication. So social media and search engines have changed our access to shared knowledge in the following ways. Disinformation can be produced and shared widely and rapidly on social media and search results. Um, disinformation erodes trust in media and other news sources. Social media and news. Social media platforms such as Facebook have a dramatically different um, structure than previous media technologies. So content can be relayed among users with no significant third-party filtering, fact-checking, or editorial judgment. An individual user with no track record or reputation can in some cases reach as many readers as Fox News, CNN, or New York Times. So there are, algorithmic, um, there are algorithms at work here in our news feeds. Uh, social media platforms have more control than you may realize over your news feed. These algorithms or computer programs are designed to increase your engagement in the form of likes, shares, and comments, and an algorithm will promote disinformation and misinformation as readily as it promotes legitimate news as long as it engages us. In 2021, a little under half, 48% of U.S. adults said they got news from social media often or sometimes. It is notable that this Pew survey found a five percentage point decline um, in that from 2020 to 2021. Uh, note that social media platforms are not news publishers or aggregators. They serve as gateways to news content. So the January 6th 2021 siege of the Capitol illustrates the intersection between social media, democracy, and news. This Washington Post article from January 4th, 2022, so a year later, describes Facebook's connection to the wide distribution of election disinformation, which led to real world consequences. This chart from the Pew Research study mentioned previously shows how many Americans get their news from different social media sites. For example, 
66% of U.S. adults use Facebook. And actually, I should say this is a 2021 study. 66% um, uh, of U.S. adults back then were using Facebook, and 31% of U.S. adults regularly get news on Facebook. Uh, one finding from the full study was that younger adults, ages 18 to 29, are far more likely to regularly get news on both Snapchat and TikTok than other age groups. So you can see here's the TikTok um, and the Facebook users. So uh, look at how many of your peers are getting their news from TikTok. So in the 18 to 29 age group um, in 2022, um, 26 percent. Um, and so that's the highest. And then you can, wherever you are on this age range, you could see um, what your peers are doing, um, how much they're using TikTok um, to get news. The Washington Post is reporting that the beverage industry is paying influencer dietitians on TikTok. So this is a story from September 13th, 2023. Um, and the Washington Post is a national newspaper, and they are reporting that the beverage industry is paying influencer dietitians on TikTok to essentially promote sodas, sugar, and artificial sweeteners. The influencers are not clearly disclosing on their posts that they are being paid by industry lobbying organizations. So that happens on... Um, on, on social media. Um, so this is just a little bit of a, a definition, uh, misinformation and disinformation. So misinformation typically describes false falsehoods of fact that are spread either, either purposely or accidentally. Disinformation, on the other hand, always refers to information specifically designed to mislead or deceive consumers to influence their attitudes, beliefs, or behaviors. Claire Wardle is a scholar who studies mis- and disinformation. She said she stopped using the term fake news in 2017 when it became clear that it was being weaponized by politicians around the world as an attack against the media. In her own work, she recommends these nuanced definitions. She has developed this continuum of seven types of mis- and disinformation. So the low to high spectrum characterizes the degree of intent to deceive. So for example, satire or parody, like the Onion website, uh, does not intend to cause harm, but has the potential to fool. Uh, contrast that with at the highest uh, in, uh, intent to deceive, fab purely fabricated con content made up um, websites that are pretending to be somebody else, uh, all different types of completely fabricated, made up information. And that's at the top um, for deceiving and doing harm. And now AI makes fabricated content a bigger concern because it is so easy to generate fake text and fake images. Um, so the onion is I just uh, mentioned that. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this, but it is a satire site. And um, this is what it looks like. You know, it looks like it could be uh, just a legitimate news here. They've got latest news opinion. Uh, so at a glance, you might think that this is for real, but it's really um, making fun of what's going on out there in the world in a way to educate people uh, the um, sort of the ridiculousness of certain things. Um, and so you might see uh, um, this is 54 year old Facebook user wins Nobel prize for own extensive internet research into dangers of COVID vaccine. And if you think about that, that's of course, that, that's not going to win anybody a Nobel prize. So you need to be aware that there are sites like this, and this is one of the most uh, famous of the um, spoof or satire sites. Um, and then mention, when I'm mentioning the, um, the AI, uh, these are not images of real models. They are artificial faces that have been generated using deep learning technology. 
So deep fakes can be used to create false identities. This is, an, um, you know, this kind of activity does occur um, out there and uh, you just need to be aware that it, it's happening. So we've touched on social media and on news organizations and their role in distributing news. Now let's consider what role advertising plays in the news ecosystem. So social media platforms want you to engage with their platforms to show you as many ads as possible. News sites, whether credible or untrustworthy, are funded in part by ads. Ad brokers, mainly Google and Facebook, want to place ads. Advertisers have limited controls over where ad brokers show their ads. So um, I just, I wanna show a brief video um, from Wired Magazine on how um, fake news works. And it's really talking about the, um, the advertising aspect, the monetary aspect of this activity. Part of 2016 in a small town called Velas in Macedonia, an 18 year old high school student discovered that he could make more money than his parents by building fake news sites. To protect his identity, we'll call him Boris. And here's how he did it. He wrote tons of false articles about the US election, most of them salacious. The articles were shared on Facebook, garnering tons of traffic. So much so that Boris's most popular website earned him $16,000 over the course of a few months. That's way higher than the average monthly salary in Macedonia, which is $371. So Boris dropped out of high school and he was not alone. In the final weeks of the election, there were more than a hundred political websites registered to Bellis. The most popular stories were pro-Trump, but that's not because Boris and his fake news publishers liked the candidate. They just like the money. Trump supporters just happen to be more likely to share fake news. Researchers tracked 30 million shares of pro-Trump stories on Facebook in the months before the election. But why were companies advertising on fake news sites? They weren't directly. Those ads were placed by services like Google AdSense or AppNexus, which act as intermediaries between advertisers and small-time publishers like Boris. They negotiate how much ads cost and manage payments from advertisers to publishers. Those ads follow people wherever they go online. Remember when you recently searched for that onesie? Well, that search was tracked and matched with advertisers selling that product. So everywhere you go on the web, a onesie ad follows. Advertisers and these services create blacklists of sites they won't advertise against. But it's hard to keep up. So sometimes they pop up on fake news sites that haven't been discovered yet. While Boris and his friends were making money, fake news became one of the major scandals of the 2016 elections. Many wondered if sites like Boris's even helped Trump win. A joint study by NYU and Stanford University found that it may not have tipped the election as much as one would think. It found that one fake news story would need to be as persuasive as 36 TV commercials to swing a voter. Still, the backlash forced tech giants like Google and Facebook to do something. Facebook is now partnering with fact-checking organizations like Snopes and PolitiFact to flag articles that present deliberately misleading content. Google now cuts off AdSense revenue to sites with spoof domains like NewYorkTimesPolitics.com. But that's still flagging fake news after it's been published and shared. So tech companies like Moat propose combining algorithms with human insight to catch fake news before it spreads. Uh, a nonprofit company called the Global Disinformation Index, or GDI, has several, several primers on how disinformation works in the news ecosystem. This GDI study from December 2021 shows that advertising continues to fund disinformation. This study is titled Ad Funded Climate Change Disinformation, Money, Brands, and Ad Tech. GDI's study estimates that $36.7 million will go to 98 climate change disinformation websites on an annual basis. So this is a page um, captured um, from a website called The Federalist. Here is an example of the well-known Johns Hopkins University, and they are advertising on this site 
their uh, master's degree in environmental sciences and policy on a page from the Federalist that has um, an article containing climate change disinformation. Um, so new data shows climate change hysteria isn't grounded in science. That is climate change disinformation. Um, so uh, this this page that we're looking at on the left side uh, that that the GDI presented to us says that the brand is John Hopkins and and they're advertising their master's degree in environmental sciences and policy. The ad is served by Google and you can um, it, it is served by Google and the site is the Federalist and it's it's uh, presenting climate change disinformation. So the you can go to this site and see other um, examples of that kind of um, advertising on uh, disinformation websites. So here we have um, just a, a summary of um, which ad tech companies are profiting from climate change disinformation. On a positive note, GDI reports that Google's share was previously 70%, but in December, 2021, and I realize that's been a little while ago, I haven't updated this, um, but had been reduced to 38.8%. So it could be even less now, but just be aware that it was uh, going down and they were actually uh, pulling back from that kind of activity. So that's a good sign. So when you think about, well, all of this misinformation and disinformation, you might wonder who, who does this? So who are the people that start viral, dis, uh, viral information? Uh, this video shows that there are many different motivations for creating and sharing disinformation. Why coronavirus started? Or what might cure it? Well, search online and you'll find thousands of answers many of which aren't true. I investigate disinformation for the BBC and I'm often asked who starts these rumours and who spreads them? Well, as always, the answer isn't straightforward, so I've broken them down into five different types. One, the Joker. Lots of people have been sharing funny posts and memes online, and some of them are pretty good but others go too far and people actually believe that they're true. Two, the scammer. This lot are looking to make money from the pandemic. Some create fake texts trying to get hold of your bank account details. Or others plug dodgy advice looking to sell their remedies and cures. Three, the politician. The people in charge can also spread fake news. That includes officials and state-sponsored media from around the world. Officials in China and the US have been trading misinformation since the start of the virus, each accusing the other of deliberately creating it. Of course, neither of those claims are true. And there are concerns about foreign interference. That's when states spread misleading information abroad in order to further their own aims. But it can be very difficult to trace interference back to the people in charge, or to figure out who are behind networks of fake accounts that are pushing misleading information. Four conspiracy theorist. These people think that nothing is as it seems. They've falsely linked 5G to coronavirus, speculated about who created it, or even suggested that coronavirus doesn't exist at all. None of these are true. These ideas have been bouncing around on the internet for a while, but they've started getting more attention as worried people look for quick answers to their questions. 5. The Insider. There's information that apparently comes from someone you'd trust, an unnamed doctor, professor or hospital worker. But it turns out they don't exist. Or if they do, it seems to be a game of Chinese whispers gone wrong. And this misinformation goes viral because it's shared, often by a relative in your WhatsApp group who passes it on just in case, or by a celebrity who amplifies it to their thousands of followers. Tech companies, media regulators and governments decide what happens when people start and spread misinformation but ultimately we're all responsible for stopping its spread. Check out our top tips for spotting and stopping misleading stuff online and think of what you share. So um, as an example, uh, this article is a recent example of a state actor spreading disinformation regarding a natural disaster. 
Um, so this is was published in the New York Times on September 11th. China sows disinformation about Hawaii fires using new technologies. Uh, and it, it it says the disaster was not natural, they said, in a flurry of false posts that spread across the internet, but was the result of a secret weather weapon being tested by the United States. To bolster the plausibility, the post carried photographs that appeared to have been generated by artificial intelligence programs, making them among the first to use these new tools to bolster the aura of authenticity of a disinformation campaign. So um, that is an example of um, interference and um, state actors spreading disinformation. And um, so why do we believe and share disinformation? Uh, disinformation often appeals to our emotions. Consider your reactions. People are more likely to share something that makes them angry or happy. One thing we can do is step back, take a breath, and try to reconnect with our reasoning, because that will often be enough to make us think twice about sharing disinformation. Another thing that happens is that disinformation sometimes has a patina of credibility, a kernel of truth, and it just seems somehow plausible to us. This is particularly a risk when media is presented with an incorrect context or caption. So uh, fake social media accounts can be run by computer programs called bots and um, they um, uh, they're used to trick news feed algorithms into believing that someone or some item is popular by creating fake shares likes or comments so when we see so that something has had lots a lot of engagement we may be enticed to join the crowd um the illusory truth effect is the effect that the more we encounter something, the more we believe it. Uh, so repetition makes it seem true. We hear it over and over, so it must be true. Um, and uh, that leads uh, to the possibility that every time a lie is repeated, it appears slightly more plausible. And then finally, we have confirmation bias. We all have our own ideas uh, that are complicated, um, resulting from our our whole lives and are the world we live in. Um, and so the confirmation bias uh, is there. And we, um, so when information confirms our view, we tend to believe it, um, whether we've investigated other sides of the story or not. So these are some of the mechanisms of disinformation at work. In this comic, the person is doing research. They stop at the very first thing they find because it agrees with what they are trying to find out and that confirms what they're looking for. So that's the confirmation bias. And then another concern is filter bubbles. This occurs when algorithms reflect our choices back online back into what we see on the internet. Our, I should say our online choices, our, our choices online are reflected back into what we see on the internet. So algorithms and our confirmation bias work together to create the filter bubble of information that we are exposed to. When you only read algorithmic feeds, then you're in a filter bubble of your own construction. So you're in your feed, which includes the videos that you like, the brands you like, the news you like, the facts you like, um, et cetera. And you um, might get information overload uh, and, and then you might avoid information altogether, but you also might, um, just be getting that confirmation bias and don't feel the need to um, look further. So let's say you come across a website in your news feed or in your own searching. A good first step is to find out about the credibility of an author, organization, or website, um, is to find out what other people on the internet are saying about them. I'm going to show you a video about lateral reading where you check the internet to learn more about a source or about claims being made. How are you taught to evaluate the credibility of online sources? Everyone knows that information on the web may be shallow, incomplete, inaccurate, or heavily biased, and many of us have been taught to explore the features of a website to assess its credibility. You may have learned to ask, is this site a .com or a .org? 
Does the site incorporate advertisements? Was it written by someone who appears to have appropriate expertise? Are there citations to supporting evidence or research? Is the information current? While sometimes useful, these questions can also misdirect you because they rely on superficial markers of credibility and authority. For example, some .org websites may be reliable and nonpartisan, while others may be partisan political action groups or even promoters of widely debunked conspiracy theories. On the other hand, some of the most authoritative news websites are .coms with advertisements, such as the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. Relying on superficial markers to evaluate credibility can be problematic because most websites won't say, I was designed by a biased political organization with an intent to manipulate you, or I'm leaving out important information that might give you a more objective perspective on this issue, or I was written by an uninformed person with no relevant expertise. So how do we improve our ability to evaluate websites when we know that some individuals and organizations may be working hard to misrepresent themselves and misinform us by using a skill called lateral reading? Lateral reading is a simple concept used by professional fact checkers and other savvy thinkers to judge the credibility of unfamiliar sources. While many of us judge a website by reading vertically, scrolling up and down to look for markers of credibility, or perhaps clicking on links within the site, fact checkers jump outside the site, using new browser tabs to seek additional information about the site's credibility, reputation, funding sources, and potential biases. In other words, fact checkers read laterally or horizontally across multiple web pages to get a big picture view of the site they're evaluating. They use Wikipedia, credible news sources, and other references on the web to understand what a source is and how credible it might be. They don't just take the source's word for it. For example, this news story on heavy metal music fan culture is on fizz.org, a website that may be unfamiliar to us. But if I open up a new tab, I can search for information about fizz.org and find out that it's a news aggregator that often republishes science news from across the web. I can also verify that the research discussed in the news story originated from University College London and PhD anthropology student Lindsay Bishop. By doing some homework on the source through lateral reading, we get a much better sense of what this source is and its level of credibility. We can also begin to think about its strengths and limitations from a more informed point of view. In this case, we might decide the information is reliable and a good starting point, but we might also want to look beyond this brief news story and find the original research or other more in-depth scholarly information. With lateral reading, you can move beyond the superficial aspects of website evaluation and develop a more nuanced and more complete perspective on the credibility of your sources. So reading laterally includes fact-checking. There are websites that exist just to check facts. Here are a, very, a few very reputable fact-checking sites, uh, including factcheck.org, PolitiFact, The Washington Post Fact Checker, and Snopes. They are all transparent in their process for how they investigate claims and come to decisions about whether a claim is true, partially true, or false. You could go to any of these fact-checking sites and feel confident that they are diligent in their process. Um, we're going to take a look at the factcheck.org website uh, now. And I just wanted you to see what uh, this fact check site looks like. And they're talking about current uh, claims that are being investigated and uh, what they're finding out about them. And they have an about us where they talk about their process, including, you know, what types of claims do they investigate um, and what is their research process? So they're very transparent and just wanted you to see what, what one of these looks like. And so remember the all sides has the uh, media bias chart. They also have a fact check bias chart. So it's a good idea to maybe try multiple check uh, uh, fact checking sites to compare what they're saying. Um, there will be differences. So um, all sides states that again, that ratings do not reflect accuracy or credibility, only a source's perspective as revealed by story choice and how it interprets facts. Um, and ratings are based on online fact-checking content only. So here are some more fact-checking sites that you can try out. 
memes are another, you know, um, it, it was mentioned in, you know, the, um, in the BBC Mariana Spring video we saw where she was talking about jokers. And so memes are often quite, you know, entertaining and funny and, and also um, have other, uh, you know, purposes. Um, and I'm going to just talk a little bit about this. So um, unlike an article that makes a lot of claims, a meme has one or two pictures and a little bit of text. People make memes about the news, but memes are not journalistic reports of the news. Because they omit so much context, they are easy to create and easily used to misinform. Memes require a different strategy to parse and contextualize in order to understand what they are trying to imply. I can't go into this topic in great detail, but I wanted to let you know that there are specific strategies for analyzing specific types of content, such as memes and miscaptioned or out of context images. And you can go to a site called Know Your Meme, and um, we're also gonna look at a Google reverse uh, search. So let me just, um, we're almost finished here, but I'm just gonna, well, you know, um, Let's see. Oh, it didn't come up. Mm. Let's see. I'm going to try refreshing it. Oh, so this Know Your Meme site is a good place to go to get context for your meme, and they will um, support or debunk um, what a meme is trying to communicate if there's something that's not true. Um, and so this is back... Um, in during at the beginning of the war, uh, Russia Ukraine war, um, that you there were they debunked the know your meme site debunked the ghost of Kiev meme. Um, and you could, you know, watch a video, you can read through and find out about the origin of the meme, how it spread, um, developments in the meme, etc. So that's something you may want to visit when you're trying to um, evaluate a meme. So we're going to look at how to do a Google reverse image search to fa fact check images. So if you're trying to find out uh, the authenticity of a photo or the, if the caption matches or the history of the photo, where it came from, etc. It's a thousand words. But when you're searching for an image online, how do you know that every one of those words is tr true? We're going to show you a simple trick you can do it with Google and it's called a reverse image search. Okay, so there are a couple of different ways you can do this. Uh, the first one is uh, to go to images.google.com. And you can go over there. You, it's, this looks like a normal Google search page, but we have the Google images icon and you'll see the little camera search by image icon right here. That's key. Uh, now, one of the first ways, so one of your first of the few options we'll show you today to do this is a drag and drop. So let's say you have an image saved on your desktop. Here it is. I'm just going to drag it right over here into the search bar. It will upload the file and I get a whole list of hits where that image uh, is in the, in the page. Um, and so I can then go and investigate all of these different sources where that image shows up. One of the second options you can do is to click the little search by image icon and you can paste a URL in there. And let's say I've found a URL where this, this image I want to search is, and I can paste it in there and search. Once again, I will get a big list of hits of different sites where this image shows up. Let's talk about a third way that is even a little bit easier to do, and this is probably the simplest way uh, and one that I highly recommend, only if you're using Chrome, though. Um, let's say you're on a web page and you find an image and you want to know more about that image. Uh, you can right click or control click on the image and then scroll down here to search, search Google for image. And automatically a new tab will open up in your Chrome browser, giving you the same results. So the last step you want to do, and the most important one, is probably to ask some critical questions about the results that you just found. You want to ask questions like, on what kinds of websites does this image show up? Are there any clues about where the image originated? 
Has the image been altered in any way, any place that you've seen it? And that's just the tip of the iceberg. For more information about asking critical questions with a reverse image search or just about fact checking in general, head on over to commonsense.org slash education. Okay, so we're almost out of time. I'm just going to show you this list um, of eight ways that critical thinkers know when a news story is unreliable, disreputable, or embarrassing to share. And it actually was a um, workshop from a workshop on conspiracy theories. And so it, it these are some red flags. It explicitly states that it is telling the truth and or everyone else is lying to you. Uh, so it contains short, conclusory opinion statements. Um, sorry, let me go back. Um, eh, it's organized as a list of questions or hypotheses. And uh, this is literally the opposite of news, which is answers, not questions. Um, and it puts the burden on you to answer the questions. And it asks you to prove a negative, which is often impossible. Uh, it suggests an insidious plot by someone media, elites, corporations, government, but doesn't say exactly what the plot is or provide any evidence for it. And it elevates the credibility of one expert who goes against the consensus of their entire expert peer group. For example, one scientist versus all the other scientists. And it claims that being taken down for promoting misinformation is censorship, which therefore proves that the item taken down is actually true. And there is no reason why something widely debunked and taken down would enhance credibility. So just that, keep that in mind. Um, we're um, at the end, except I'm going to show you, uh, I just going to tell you that the library has uh, databases that you can use newspaper databases where you can go and look at um, journalist, journalistic reporting, um, those journalists that are using those techniques for um, having an ethical news coverage, and those are available on our website. But if you are attending this workshop for extra credit, it's important for you to know that there's a, a code phrase that you need to provide your instructor with. So it's know your meme, all one word. That's the code word. And um, the databases I was mentioning are listed here under databases. And um, let me see what time is it? It's 3.30. So um, we subscribe to a database called the um, U.S. News Stream, and it includes the U.S. major daily newspapers, and uh, along with uh, several other newspaper collections. So here is one place where you can go and look at a variety of newspapers and not have to pay for them. And they the full text of the newspapers are there. So, um, in, including even the Corsair, your local, your college newspaper, um, there's uh, back issues and archive of those, as well as access to the current uh, newspaper. But U.S. Newsstream gives you the New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, uh, Los Angeles Times, several major national newspapers, and a lot of other regional papers are included in this list. So, I want to encourage you to go to the library website, go to the databases, um, and also use that we have a, a research guide called Fake News and Disinformation that this page is a screenshot of. And it includes um, other literacy projects. So you, if you're interested in the topic, you can get additional information. There are links to fact-checking sites. Um, there's uh, some information about evaluating resources and uh, links to eBooks on the topic. So hope that this has helped you to um, get an overview, a little bit of an overview of this topic and be aware that the librarians here are here to help you and to help you navigate um, when you're doing your research papers or if you're just trying to figure out what news to read, we can link you to different types of sources and talk to you about um, their perspectives as we understand them. So uh, are there any questions before I end? It is 3.31, so I don't want to keep anyone, but um, I'm here to answer a question if you have one. Thank you for coming to this workshop. We're here, as I mentioned before, at the library. You can chat with us online from the library website. And if you just go to Google and type in SMC Library, you will get to the library website and you'll find that we have um, 
a lot of resources, a way of asking us questions online. It's an Ask a Librarian link, and that's a chat service. We will discuss with you your research and we can share our screens with you and show you how to get to different types of resources. And we're here to help. Oh, I think there is one chat. Okay. Oh, okay. All right. You're welcome. Thank you. I'm, I'm, you're welcome. My pleasure. And all right. Well, I guess we're going to, I'm going to sign off and have a great rest of your day, everyone. And take care. <laughs>